Uh, um, so how much is that? So. Welcome again to the podcast editor's mastermind, where Steve Stewart likes to dance for us, and also we talk about the business side of podcasting. If you've been with us for the last few weeks, you know that we're in the middle of a series about finding clients because that is one of the most common questions we get is, how do I find my first client or how do I find my next client? It's a question I'm asking myself. Since I don't know the answer, we thought we'd come to you. And so we're bringing on guests from the community and we've got one for you tonight. Before we get to that, quick introductions. I'm Brian Etzminger. You can find me at toptieraudio.com and below me is... Jennifer Longworth at bourbonbarrelpodcasting.com. And we didn't cover this off in the green room, so my apologies, but this is Steve Stewart, the one and only, the true blue, not the grandfather of podcasting, but certainly the podcast editor that many of us know. And we've got him on here today to talk about his first client, because we want to know how did he find his first client? What did he learn? What can we take from that? And all of the other amazing thing that's, things that Steve knows. Well, maybe not all of them, but we'll take what we can from you. So Steve, welcome. You only get an hour. Only get an hour. Yeah. Only okay. get an hour. Thank well, you. For I mean, having you only me. need like three minutes to get everything that I know. So <laughs> that's that's perfect. So, Steve, I know that you've caught a couple of these live streams. We like to start off with a little bit of history. Like, yeah, you're a podcast editor. You've been doing this for a while. I don't want to demean that. But at some point, your love affair with podcasting started, and that's kind of what led you down this path. So maybe just take us back to that. What was it that got you in love with podcasting? And then how did that transition to finding clients and starting to be an editor. Yeah, I was a content creator back in the day, we'll say. Uh, 2007, I started a financial blog about personal finance topics. And I had been DJing for a good 20 years at that point. So I knew gear, I had records, I knew how to DJ, talk on the mic. So when I, I learned about podcasts and how you could listen to spoken word audio in the car and all this stuff, I was like, oh, this is interesting. This would be a great way to market my business. So in 2010, I launched my own podcast, the Money Plan SOS podcast, and it was just this love affair of the medium that I grew into. Uh, so I, I was trying to learn everything I could just about how the medium works. So I had to understand all the intricities and little, the problems that occur in the middle of an RSS feed, right? So <laughs> yeah. in 2011, a year after I started my podcast, there was a conference that started. It was called the Financial Blogger Conference. So it's like, these are my people. That's great. But I didn't get to go to the first one. I went to the second one, fell in love with the community fantastic. And I was one of the very few people there who had a podcast. So I was one of the few bloggers with a podcast, but I was always encouraging people to, you know, get their face and their voice in the blog. It was all these writers, but you'd have these stale sites with no visuals. You know, they had maybe have a logo, but no pictures of them yet. They were telling all these personal stories about money. So I just, I was always helping people. And a couple of times I got to speak. And then in late 2015, a couple of well-known bloggers were talking about starting a show together, but they didn't want to have to do everything themselves. They were really smart about outsourcing what they didn't want to do. And they, they knew I was always out there being helpful. So they contacted me and said, Steve, would you like to help us out? I'm like, sure. I love helping people with their podcasts. It's great. They said, we just want to record. Will you do the rest? I'm like, you hit record. I do the rest. It means I got to do the editing. Okay. But I got to charge you for it. It's not easy. And they said, Absolutely, Steve. It's the no like, and trust factor at work right there. The two well-known bloggers launched the show. We launched it in January, 2016. It blew up because they had big email lists. So of course, you know, you get a lot of people following it right away. And other people in that community, the FinCon conference community heard about my services. Uh, it was just a side hustle. I wasn't focusing any of my energy on that. That was something I did for myself, but more people started to call and Funny enough, I was actually in a mastermind at the time, and the mastermind was like, Steve, you love podcasting. You like the editing part that you're doing for these people. You got people calling you for the service. Give up what you're doing. So I gave up the financial coaching business that I was working eight years on. I'd already quit my day job because I thought maybe I could spend a year focusing on the financial coaching business and make it work. It didn't. And so they convinced me to just give it up and make that leap into full self-employment, editing for other people. And here's the crazy part. Within six months, it became a career. It was, it, it was a full-time job. Even if I hadn't like given everything else up, it was just too much to be able to do all by myself. And then it just grew from there. I don't know that I've ever asked this, but 
Do you ever think to yourself, man, I miss what I was doing before? Yes. Really? I totally do. I miss doing my podcast. I miss doing the coaching. I miss doing all that stuff. But I also love what I'm doing now. And I mean, I get to run a community for podcast editors. You know what that feels like. To be involved with all these people. And so there's there's a lot of big changes I get to, you know, impact here in the community. So I feel blessed that I'm able to do that as well. So I while I miss everything I was doing, I'm so excited about what I'm doing right now that I can't find a happy medium between the two because it isn't possible. So the last few people we've had on, we've talked a little bit about sort of like a beta client and something else like that. We might come back to that. But I'm kind of wondering from what you've shared, like what you're doing, I think is really rewarding to you. What is it the most rewarding about what you're able to do now? Well, it's selfishly, it's going to be, I get to make my own schedule and work from home. I had a day job while I was starting my blogging and podcast. and the travel there began at like 25% of the time and it grew to almost a hundred percent over a 15 year span. So towards the end of that, I was traveling all the time. My daughter, she was, you know, in her teens at that time and it was, I was missing all of it. Plus being on the road just kind of stinks all that time. So the biggest benefit is just being able to work from home and have my own schedule. So the last couple of people we've had on have talked about how their first client was kind of a beta client. I don't know if that's true for you, but what was that first client experience like for you when you when you started? There were two people for one show who I admired. And so I was looking up to them because they were just, they were already successful. And you're saying this beta client thing. I'm trying to think of what the, what the question means there. Well, uh, like this is my first time as a professional podcast editor. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> how did it go? <laughs> right. Well, it was a side hustle at first and it just grew yeah. into a career. And because there was in such a short period of time, because there was so much business that it filled up my day, I didn't have time to think about that. I had already pretty much solidified within a short period of time, a career working for my friends, which is also very strange that I could fill the, the roster with that. So. I already knew who my ideal client was because I was one of them. They were me. I was them. We all have a passion for teaching people about personal finance. And I think that's another reason why they like working with me versus somebody else is because I know their material. They know I care about their material. So if there is something wrong, I'm going to tell them about it. And hopefully I can, maybe I can do something in post-production to help them out. Usually it's not the case, but then the feedback comes back and, and they're a little more appreciative of what I might be able to suggest and things like that. I love having you here because I just so want to ask you this question. You talked about how you're starting as a side hustle. You're starting working for some people that you really admire, but you also have a background in business. You've been building a coaching business, all that stuff. How did you go about setting your prices for that first show? (laughs) Oh, I'm like everybody else. I started out at, you know, bottom basement prices. I was working for less than minimum wage, thinking I quoted something reasonable. Then I calculate the hours and divide it in the money and you know you're making $5 an hour. Absolutely. Plus they added on a couple of weeks after we started, they're like, Steve, would you write the show notes? Sure. I can do that. That was the piece I hated the most doing of my, oh, no. on my own show. I hated it. So I'm like, okay, I can give you a title and a quick summary, bullet points, stuff like that, which it was so stupid of me to just agree to that blindly. Probably because again, I admire these two successful bloggers who are now doing a podcast. I, you know, you have to sit there and now you have to listen. Oh, if they mention a book, got to write it down. Oh, if they mention a link, I got to write it down. Oh, if they mention this, I got to write it down. I wasn't ready for that, even though I, I did that for my own show, but I was the one creating the content. So I knew it was going to go into the outline before I even mm-hmm. started. Or if it was a guest that was doing an interview, then you know, there's usually only a couple links. But yeah, it was a, a surprise there. But the original price that I was getting paid for those, and each episode was easily 60 minutes raw recording straight to finish, was uh, 45 bucks. Ooh. And that was in 2016. Wow. I know people who've done less. We've, we've heard yeah. Daniel tell his story. I think he's, he was earning less right away. I was less, but I wasn't doing show notes too. So you didn't upcharge when they said, let's do show notes too. You just said, okay. I think I did, but it was like oh, five okay. or 10 bucks. It wasn't much of anything. <laughs> it was sad. Yeah. It didn't last that way for long. Thank goodness. <laughs> I really appreciate you sharing about how you set the price. And one of the things that I've noticed for me I love working with people that I admire, people that I would consider to be friends or friendlies, if you will. The challenge that I have with those is I always try to find a way to make what they're asking in terms of a budget work. 
right? And sometimes the reality is that their budget cannot support what I do. And that's it's a really difficult relational thing for me to 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 wade through. And then also there's the whole thing about raising rates and stuff like that. How have you navigated some of those relational and those price increases, that kind of stuff? I walk into a conversation about working together with somebody in two ways. One, I'm always giving. And two, I'm very comfortable with the rate I'm going to quote them because these are my people. They know I'm going to take care of them. If my reputation hasn't set in already, if I haven't been, if other people haven't bragged about me, which tends to happen in that community, people brag about each other, then, you know, then we got to start over. They're probably not going to hire me, but I can go in again in two ways. One is, is giving them a, a quote and say, Hey, here's my rates. I will definitely do the work for you. You know, I'll take care of you if this is in your budget, if you can make this work. If not, I've got solutions for you. And I also give them the solutions. And that leads into the giving piece. Anybody in my community, I'm going to help out, whether it's a three hour call or something like that. If they're in that FinCon community, I'm already helping them in some way. I also run a Facebook group for the FinCon podcast group. You know, so it's like the niche inside of the niche. So I'm always, and I'll be sponsoring FinCon in October next month. I'll be speaking. I'll be just giving. So giving is always a part of it. And I've, I've definitely worked that into my, my schedule where I, I have, the ability to give freely. And I don't feel like I'm taking away from my own income or somebody else's income. I'm getting somebody interested in at least on the right path to either start a podcast or continue and make one better. You mentioned one thing that kind of piqued my interest. And we, we've already talked a little bit about where I want to go with this, but you said you have confidence in your rates. I think part of that confidence comes from your skill and your experience and the reputation that you have. But there's also some understanding of like what the market will bear, so to speak. So you could say I'm worth a hundred bucks an hour and you might absolutely be, but if I can hire somebody else that does the same job for less, that starts to turn it into a commodity. Can you share with us like how it is that you're able to get a pulse on the market? <laughs> yeah, it's a leading question. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the pulse on the market really comes from the surveys that I've been doing in, in Mark Deal, my business partner in the Podcast Editor Academy have been doing for the past four or five years where we take a survey. It's a, and this year is a simpler survey even just to get uh, information from the community who is editing for money. You know, what do they charge? How long does it take them? What are they using as their DAW? All this stuff. And from there, I've seen that I'm at least the first couple of years, I realized I'm just at or just below the average rate, which was interesting. But I also don't claim that I'm the best editor. In fact, I can tell you right now, I am not the best podcast editor. I will try my darndest to serve my clients. So that puts me above, I'm not trying to, to discount the services that somebody on Fiverr or Upwork does, but when you know your client and you know that you're working with them on a continual basis, you're going to try harder. Mm -hmm. You're going to put a little extra effort in when it's required. So rather than someone who's on Fiverr who's waiting for the next deal to come in, and again, I don't want to discount what people are doing on Fiverr, but I have a relationship with these people, so I've really got to deliver. So as far as the prices are, um, I realized uh, the first couple of years I was a little bit below. So I had the confidence to then be able to raise my rates a little bit. Plus, I could then go back and say, look, I've got this history. Now, I want people who are watching this to uh, or listening to this in the podcast. Thank you for being there. Don't discount the time that you spent before you started working for somebody else. Yeah. I had five full years of just editing my own podcast, plus, and I'll count this, an additional 10 years before that of using my DAW on doing different things. So I know how to use, I know how to digitally capture audio. I know how to turn it into something you could, well, back then it was burning it to a CD, but then, you know, turning it into a podcast when podcasts came along. So I knew how to do all this stuff. That's history. That's experience. That you can then say, look, I've got, and, and now I can claim just in editing for other people, I've got eight years in, but I've actually got more like 18 years in right. of being able to do stuff with audio on a computer. Yeah, I can say like I have over 20 years of editing audio experience, but I've only been doing podcasts for eight. But, you know, similar story. If somebody's coming from a radio background, they use Pro Tools at a recording studio, that counts for sure. So why would you not? claim that when you're talking to somebody, because if you're just doing your own show, but you've got 15 years of experience using digital audio equipment or even video now, then, mm -hmm. you know, that's experience. So don't discount yourself like I did. 
That's hard though. Because also like when you're starting out, especially, you know, eight years ago when I did, I didn't know we didn't have this survey from the podcast editor Academy yet. I had no idea what to charge and I found someone who wanted to pay me. So I threw out a number and they said, yes, you know, (laughs) Mm -hmm. I started at 40, 45 bucks an episode. Why can't somebody else? You can't stay there for long. And if you're doing it as a side hustle, it's okay to do it for a while that way. But it can't be a permanent thing, especially if you do want to make money serving podcasters in the podcast space. It doesn't have to be just editing. You could do all kinds of things, show notes, video now, social media, shorts, video shorts, stuff like that. So that obviously would allow you to charge more uh, for your services. You just got to have the skills to be able to deliver. And I hear that you might be dabbling in video now. I am. I'm not satisfied with what I'm doing. Um, What's funny is I, now I went into that charging about three X what I charge my client for the audio podcast. Mm -hmm. So I felt like it was a good price, but I'm not feeling like I'm delivering that quality yet. Go back to what I was talking about a minute ago. I have been using video editing software for, what is this, 2023? For probably about 11 years for creating courses, for Mostly that's it, creating courses and stuff. Plus now we all have video recorders right here on our smartphones. So I could say I've got, you know, digital experience here. So I knew I could do the job. I haven't quite delivered the product that I want to give them yet. So I'm trying to find efficiencies and ways to do that. But man, what a time suck. (laughs) Oh, that's why I'm avoiding it until I can't. (laughs) It just takes a long time. And it's worth having two computers. I haven't set it up this way yet, but I'm thinking about it. Because if I've got one computer rendering a video, I can't be editing another video. I think some software programs will let you do that. Maybe DaVinci does or something, but I can't do it. I can't do two video projects at once. So if I've tied up my computer, time to do the books, uh, social media for myself. I don't know. Writing a newsletter, go have a lunch. (laughs) (laughs) So it's a real time suck. And it's not just the actual work to sometimes too. It's the waiting for a video to render. So we talk about how long it takes to edit an episode and... Audio is usually what what people say three times the length of the raw audio. What are you finding on video? Just curious. Me, it's easily more than 4X. I could probably give you an idea here of, yep, there we go. So today I was using my video editing program for, oh, only three hours? Does it not count the rendering time? (laughs) And I got got two-thirds of a video done. (laughs) <laughs> how long? How long of the video? Was uh, it was it was an hour and ten minutes, I believe. You mentioned that you're not super happy with the product that you're putting out right now. I think a lot of us start not being entirely happy with what we're doing. In fact, I would say that I don't know that I've ever achieved something where I go, "Yeah, this could not possibly have been better." But knowing that you knowingly stepped into something you weren't comfortable doing, why did you do that for the video editing? Yeah, yeah. Because if I listen back to my old episodes of my own show before I start editing for others, it's like, oh, oh yeah. my gosh, I could have done such a better job. But I didn't know any better. I, obviously, when somebody's paying you, you start to do a better job. <laughs> <laughs> but um, with video, for the past two years, people in the space have been talking about how video is the way to go. Actually, for more, more years than that, but definitely the past two years. This last summer has been huge in the FinCon community a couple of my clients, plus they're big names in the space, they have an agreement with, uh, they, they work with Cumulus for their advertising. Yes. Cumulus owns Megaphone, which is a media host. Yeah. Megaphone is owned by Spotify. And the word is that in Q1 of next year, 2024, Spotify is going to go heavy into video. And what's going to happen is if you upload your video, edited video to Megaphone, then that will go up to Spotify. And then any of the platforms that have audio, like Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, all that stuff, it rips an MP3 out of it and puts it onto those platforms. Oh, wow. And YouTube just makes sense as well as another destination because there is discoverability on YouTube more than there is in a podcast app because the podcast apps have been horrible for discovery. So uh, you can just see the writing on the wall. There's so many reasons to have to go to video. And with Spotify making a big push in Q1, to go video first and the audio is secondary. It comes from the video. You can't edit video like you can audio, which is a shame, but that's what's going to go out because the clients only want to pay you once. They don't want to have to pay you twice. And I get that. But then there's this YouTube thing, which has been exploding for 
15 years, Mm -hmm. 17, 18 years, I think it's been. And that's not going to stop. So why, why fight it? Plus YouTube next year is going to the, and they just announced this last week that Google podcast is going away next year. Right. YouTube music will be the podcast consumption app, but we already have all these videos on YouTube that people are calling podcasts. So let's make it legit. You know, YouTube music will make it legit. So that'll give us an opportunity to have an app from YouTube that'll play audio podcasts and video podcasts when the screen is turned off and without Wi-Fi. Well, I don't know if it'll be without Wi-Fi. We'll see what that is. But it, the writing's on the wall. Video is mm-hmm. coming and my clients want it. They want it for the discoverability. Here's another thing though. All of my clients want it, but only a certain number of clients will pay to have that done. Because anybody can just take their Zoom recording and throw it on YouTube. That's the problem with YouTube is you can throw anything on YouTube. It's free. What's the barrier? Anybody can take their Zoom calls and throw it on YouTube. Hey, I got a podcast on YouTube. Mm, My clients need something better than that. They need to stand out more. One of the things that you all ask on the survey is how much you charge and other what other services do you offer? Mm -hmm. So... What are you looking for with that question, I guess, to see what else we're doing or see how that affects our rates or? Yeah. In the past years, it won't be this year, but in the previous two, you know, three years, Mark Deal, my business partner at the Podcast Editor Academy, he does regression testing. I think it's just, Brian, you know what that is? Regression testing, regression analysis. What do you call it? Yeah. You just basically plot it and say, how close does it conform to the shape you would expect? Yeah. It's not just a straight up average, but it's taking all these variables into account to say, okay, the people who are doing this and this are charging a little bit more. The people who are doing this and that are not charging as much. So the services come into play. So the the survey is specifically 60 minutes of audio, noise reduction, volume leveling, editing out their MROs, turning it into an episode and making the MP3. That's the rate and how long does it take to do that? But then the other services will play into that to say, okay, if these people are charging more for that service, is it because they also have additional services that they're also charging for additionally to what the the survey is asking for? And maybe they're an expert in all things, or maybe they've got an enterprise uh, company, or maybe it's just little old Steve on Audacity isn't charging as much because he's not as good because he's using an old program. Or maybe he's spending too much time on TikTok. And that's one of the survey results we found is people who <laughs> yeah. are on TikTok weren't earning as much per oh, hour wow. of their efforts. Oh, yeah. that's funny. But then one year it was like Hindenburg and Pro Tools. Those two, the people who are using those two DAWs earned more than the average, which I think is cool and interesting. I, I don't like it either, but I think it's cool <laughs> and interesting. So for someone who like me, who is, has been traditionally below average, not too far below average because I learned my lesson on that, but still slightly below average. And who also doesn't like or want to have the raise your rates conversation. (laughs) (laughs) Would adding services be a wise thing to consider doing? In the survey, we found that people who do things like website management do charge more overall for just the audio piece of the podcast editing. Because you're obviously providing a different type of service that most podcast editors don't. If you're doing social media for somebody else. Now, we do also have a question about how many hours a week do you spend on your business? 30 hours or more, 10 to 20 or less. So we can also see if it's a part-timer. Well, they're not doing you know, four different shows each week with show notes and social media management because it's just you don't have that much time. But a full-time person would. And a full-time person is going to have the ability to charge more, and they should because obviously there's obviously we have more overhead, you know, the taxes and the health insurance and all that fun stuff. But uh, we also should be able to find some efficiencies at scale for one thing. Like, um, okay, so I, I buy RX, I just hope RX. It's a thousand dollar program. I'm going to get my money's worth out of it faster by using it 40 hours a week than I would if I was using it five hours a week. Yeah. So that regression testing, we're not going to be doing that this year with the survey, but the regression testing kind of gave us some glimpses as to other things that did impact what people charge for the audio editing, but it's not the whole story either because there are podcast managers who do more things. There's podcast producers who don't edit, but they will, they're basically engineering the live recording or they're connecting the guests or whatever. So there's, there's all kinds of things that impact the rates there. We've talked about the survey, but I just realized we haven't told people where to go to get the results. Uh Now I know that the survey is in process right now, but where should we send people? Because if they're like me, they're going to want to know where they're sitting. It may not tell you what you should charge, but it'll tell you where you fit in the market. You go to podcasteditoracademy.com. 
com slash survey. And that's where you have this. It's basically a, a dozen questions. And one of them is like, what's your name? And the other one is, do you agree to send this form to us? I mean, <laughs> yeah, very quick nice. and easy. And half of them are like, you know, the check boxes to say this, this or that. But I really would like to see like 200 responses this year because that gives us a better overlay of what the average is, at least for people who are in our community who are, you know, like on the Facebook group or in the newsletter or whatever. I'm not going to say that we're going to get a lot of people from China. Uh, I don't know what their rates would be, but, you know, we're, we're, yeah. we're looking to get as many people as we can just to get a sense for what the community is that we've been mixed up in for the past few years is. Yeah. So for those watching, we've got it in the chat. For those listening later, we'll have it in the show notes. Jennifer, I interrupted you. Sorry about that. Well, I was going to say, he keeps talking about this Facebook group, this Facebook group, this Facebook group, but I don't think he's talked about what Facebook group he's talking about. It's the Podcast Editors Club. So you've got the Academy for the Education piece. You've got the club for the community. Podcast Editors Club. It's my favorite place to be. I started in 2017 just as a kind of a birthday present to myself. I was looking around on Facebook to say, look, I'm editing now for a career. And it's nice to be in these podcast groups, but they're always talking about media hosts and microphones and all this stuff. I'm like, we've talked about Skype plenty of times. We don't need to talk about it anymore. <laughs> See how long ago that was? I said yeah. Skype. It was, said it's, Skype. True. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. So I was like, nobody's talking about the editing stuff. I'm going to create an editor's group. And I did. And Jennifer, I think you've been there for quite a long time. Quite a long time. A very long time ago. Yeah. Brian, you weren't much longer after that. Um, you know, 100 people after the first couple of months and then 1,000 and then we're up to over 8,700 people now. And all we do is talk about the post-production stuff and how to run a business. We don't talk about mics and microphones and how to record and blah. I mean, that's already been talked about and answered in all the other groups. We're, we're unique in the fact that we stick to post-production and how to run a business as an editor. And thank you for doing that. I know that adminning a group can be a challenge because not everybody has the same perspective on the purpose of the group. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> You're the person that has to be the heavy sometimes. And thank you. You know what? I don't hesitate though, because the rules are stated up front, and I have to protect my people. It's just like my clients. I, I, I'm going to take care of them and I'm going to take care of my community because we get people come in there once in a while and they post, hey, you know, I'll edit your show for you for free just to get some experience. Mm, I like that, but not here. Do right. that somewhere else. Don't promote your services here. When people do come in the group and say things like that and it doesn't get weeded out immediately, the rest of the group jumps on them and is like, we are not your people. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're looking for clients too. Thank you for... <laughs> Speaking of looking for clients though, Steve, yeah. I didn't intend for this to be a commercial for the Podcast Editor Academy, but you offer the things that podcast editors are looking for. And one of those things is from time to time, there are job openings that you're able to share. Can you share a little bit about what's going on with that and how people can find out about those job openings? Yeah. If you remember when we're talking about when people contact me for my, you know, I've given my quote and all that stuff, I'm always giving one of the ways that I can serve them is, okay, here's my quote. If you don't, if you can't work with me, cause maybe like back then I wasn't editing video or, you know, I don't do social media management. I have a whole community of people who can. So starting with the podcast editor Academy, which is the educational source for people who want to create and grow a business as a podcast editor, like I did, we have a place where I share those job postings with them. So a podcaster comes to me, Hey, we're not a fit. Okay. Guess what? I've got a whole community of people. We know that they're looking to be professional. We know they're doing continued education. They're in a supportive group. Let's go to them first. And then if that still doesn't satisfy what this person needs, then I can go to the Facebook group, post it there. And then there's 50 submissions in an hour and they've got somebody at least, you know, who's willing to give them a shot. Yeah. And that's a great thing. I was talking to somebody this week who wanted a little bit of advice about a podcast and they were looking like for what should I expect to pay? And of course I give them a rough range and I say, it's going to vary, but somewhere in here and along the way there's like, well, where should I look for people? And I was like, well, I'm an editor. It sounds like you're looking for a full-time editor. I have a full-time job and I'm an editor. I'm probably not the right person for you. Here's Steve's page. He can get this in front of as many, I didn't say as many as 8,700 people, but <laughs> he can get you in front of some people. And you should be able to get somebody that way. And I, you know, she was asking about quality control. I was like, okay, you're going to have to interview these people. Steve's not going through and testing everybody that's a part of this group, but you're going to be in front of people who are investing in growing their, their thing. Don't be afraid to do that, right? Steve's been kind enough to set this up. If you're not a fit, send him to him and let him get it in front of the community. It's, it's a really easy to way to make a connection. 
I just put a link in the private chat here to anybody who wants to see our page where it's kind of like an information page on how to find an editor. There's also hire, how to hire an editor. I should put that in there. Oh, I think I sent them to the wrong page because I sent them to the uh, stevestewart.me page. See, now I have the connections in my space. I'm going to send them to my page first. But as far as people in this community, just to give an idea of, of what we're presenting in the community overall, you know, there's find an editor and hire an editor. And that just helps people to see the same resources I have on my own website about how that process works. Nice. We give the podcaster the information real quick. Say, hey, if you're looking for an editor, here's what you might be looking for. I've got an easy template for you. So if you want to just copy this template, it basically makes a duplicate Google form that now they own. They can change the questions all they want, ask all the things that they want, provide as much or as little information as they want or need. And then they send that link to that form to me. And then that's what I share. So the editor doesn't know who they are. So then now it's up to the podcaster to then sort through all the submissions, filter out who seems to answer the questions the best, and then they contact them for interviews. So if you're filling out one of these forms, make sure you're giving concise, not long, but you know, concise and, and valuable information that a podcaster would want to know about your services. And that's from the job opportunities that we post in the two places. Yeah. And this is great. Like you said, we, we didn't intend for this to be an ad, but hey, you're looking for clients. That's why you're watching this. <laughs> so we want you to know that this is out there. One of the things I'm also wondering, Steve, is are you hearing of people getting positions that way? Like we don't, we don't oh, get yeah. that feedback. Yeah. So it does yeah. work. Yeah. Every once in a while, I bump into an Academy member say, oh yeah, I got my first gig from you. Or I got, you know, this client from, from a posting in, in the podcast center Academy. Um, I know I've had people in the Facebook group as well who have said that. So there are people getting, and it makes sense. I mean, it's the easiest way for a podcaster to walk into a room, but be completely anonymous and say, I'm looking for an editor. And then everybody was raising their hands, but then the anonymous podcaster can just filter through everybody real quick and say, okay, let's talk to these two or three people. So people are watching this. They want to know how you find new clients. You're in the community and you're working your community, but for the other people who don't have a community yet, do they need, mm. need to go find a community? How do I find new clients? What do I do? Yeah, the biggest thing for me has always been getting into groups. And that group is not a podcast group. The group is whatever you're interested in. You're more likely going to do a good job, good work for people that you want to work with, people who are probably like you. And that's why this FinCon community is just perfect. It's just the perfect scenario for me. Um, there's another person in our community who is killing it and she is my direct competition. And in fact, I'm going to see her at FinCon next month and she's going to be marketing her butt off while I'm there standing here watching and going, my gosh, you're good <laughs> anyway. But that's one community. There's hundreds of different types of communities out there. So I started out just going to meetups, local meetups. Now I don't think I ever got a client from a local meetup, but I did find friends and made relationships in those communities that also kind of led into, I don't want to say networking opportunities, but they give me credibility. So it's not the person directly that I've like Michael Max, good friend. He gives me credibility. There's other people in the space looking for an editor. He's always pointing people to me. That's valuable because they're pointing to me and not somebody else. Not to say I'm trying to steal people from somebody else. Cause I just said, I, I, if it's not a fit for me, I'm giving it to the community anyway. But if you're in a community and you're the podcast dude or dudette, then you're building credibility in that space. And you never know that where that's going to lead. That's kind of how the FinCon thing happened for me. People kept saying, oh, Steve's over there. Steve, he's the podcast guy. He can help you. And it just turned into this. Do you use subcontractors? Yep. In fact, it was 2017. So I'd started in 2016. It was full-time by mid-2016. For FinCon 2017, it was coming up. I was like, oh my gosh, okay. I have a feeling I'm going to get more clients. And I'm going there with the intention of getting more clients but I can't handle more clients. So I said, I'm going to teach a class. I'm going to charge you. So I basically, I gave a class. It was uh, five hours, one hour each week for five weeks. And then the people who turned in their homework and did a really good job, I contacted them afterwards and said, hey, you did a really good job. Would you be interested in being outsourced to? So I do contract out the people. But the good thing is I spent the time training people the way I would want to you know, have them edit my way. They were invested because they, they paid money to take the class. They learned something. Even if they weren't using my DAW, they were learning something. 
And uh, a few of them, you know, were, were really good. And I said, hey, if this is a good side hustle for you, then, you know, I, I'd love to outsource to you. And I've got five now that have been with me for over four years. Nice. Yeah. What was your capacity before you started outsourcing? What did you get to and go like, oh my gosh, I can't take anymore? It was probably 10. I, I could actually look it up, but I won't spend the time doing it on this live stream. But yeah, it's probably about 10, 10 different shows. And they were usually between 30 to an hour episodes, 30 minutes weekly? to an hour long. Yeah, most of them are weekly. I just know where I am. And I'm like, how much more can I take on before I lose my mind? And you know, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a good rule of thumb is, is six or seven. Uh, Unless you're doing additional services. Now that plays into it as well. If you're doing show notes and editing and something else, five or six might be your limit. And how much time do you actually have? You know, some people have a day job. So how many can he do? And he's probably out. I I know you have been outsourcing to other people in the past. So the good news about contractors is they're part-time. So there can be an ebb and flow there where if if it's light, you don't send them anything. If it's getting busy, you try to give them all that you can. So contractors is very, very, very handy when you're trying to grow a business. So like how many total shows do you and your contractors do now? It's, it's four contractors. I said five, didn't I? It's four. I've got one in the wings, but he left me. <laughs> <laughs> he said, if you need me, I, I can come back. So four contractors, I got 20 shows that are all, but one of them is three days a week and it's easily 75 minutes to 90 minutes of recordings to get down to 60, but no show notes, no social media, just Although I'm doing video now, so that's kind of ruined the schedule. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's the thing. I've got I've got one client who's about to sunset her show, another one who's faltering, and I think he might give it up soon because his business is taking off because of the podcast. <laughs> kind of the goal of the thing, right? Right. Yeah. He's like, I'm too busy. I got too many clients. I can't do the show. I'm like, total okay. win, dude. Yeah. Don't hurt my don't worry about hurting my feelings. You go, man. Uh so I've got a couple of clients that might go away, but now that I'm doing the video editing and I'm charging more for that, plus the time is being consumed mm-hmm. uh, and I'm not outsourcing that yet, then there's only so many hours in the week. There's only so many hours a week and it gets scary because like last month was podcast movement. I had to have all my clients work done before then. The client with the three episodes a week went to Bali for 10 days. He's like, I'd love to have all my episodes done before I, before I go. I had 11 shows to get done. Yeah, um, I, had, I had that type of situation. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just whipping those things out quick, as quick as I could. And then FinCon's next month. So, you know, it's the accordion thing. I, I had to squeeze it and empty it out as much as I could. And then it filled up as I was away. I get back, it's full. I squeeze it. And then Joe, uh, you know, Stacking Benjamin says, I need 11 shows done as soon as you can. <laughs> and I squeeze it and I go back. And then FinCon, it's, it's back and forth. Fortunately, the contractors take up a lot of that slack. One of the things that we've asked the last couple of people, and I'd like to get your perspective too, is I occasionally hear from people that are going, hey, this is great, but I'm starting to get discouraged because I'm just not seeming to find a client. What would you share with somebody who's maybe feeling like they're struggling and they're starting to wonder if it's even worth trying to find a client at this point? This is where I'm supposed to come up with an encouraging anecdote. Maybe. Or not. (laughs) We have gone the podcast space, the podcast setting space, and all the rest of the community as well has gone through some changes in the past couple of years. Well, everybody in the world did with COVID. Okay, we'll start there. But the economy has gone crazy. But even before then, I have seen plenty of people like come into the podcast setters club Facebook group and they gave it a go. It wasn't for them, but they may have found something else along the way. So I'd love to get the encouragement to say, keep going, don't quit. However, I was building a financial coaching business for eight years. I quit a day job to give it all my time because I was tired of traveling. And I was like, I can, you know, I can do it. I can do it. I'm really good at this. I can do it. And it wasn't working. But then I had people in mastermind say, quit, quit now and jump into this part-time thing you're doing. So maybe podcast editing isn't for you, but I never stopped trying until the day I said, okay, that's it. And I started to see some things working. So don't put yourself in a situation where you can't get out of it. Uh, I'd like to say don't overcommit yourself, but sometimes if you do that, then you're going to push yourself into one corner or another. And then you find that that's the corner you want to be in. Like this video thing now, I'm like, I can do this. And I'm starting to think maybe, maybe, maybe I can't. (laughs) I'm not going to quit yet. So if you're not finding a client and you've tried getting into communities, 
then look around you. What else is going on that you're interested in? Because that's how I ended up being an editor. I wanted to be a financial coach. I wanted to create content and help people with their money. And where does podcast editing fit into that storyline? It doesn't. Mm -hmm. So look around. Dan Miller says it best. Pick the bouquet of flowers closest to you. I'd like to um, maybe kind of add a little bit to that because I was editing a client episode this week. And one of the things that she mentioned, she had gone to a conference and the thing that she keeps hearing from all of her peers is that over the next year or two, expect a lot of transition. She was talking to completely unrelated to podcasting. We're going through significant transitions. And I would say that we can also see some coming through the podcasting space. I don't know what that needs to look through, look like for you, whether it's something where you need to sort of ride the raft through the rapids or if it might be something where maybe there's a place to get off on a different river, so to speak. But don't be afraid to be aware of what's going on and maybe make an adjustment. I'm considering some myself because the world is changing. It always does. It never stays the same. So we have to be aware of what's going on, whether it's our first client or our 500th client, which is not me. <laughs> I do want to do the pod decks question of the day. But before we do that, I would like to say... First off, we're thankful for Steve coming on. We're going to thank him again in a second. But we are looking for guests for the show to talk about their first client. If you are willing to share the story of your first client, whether it's a beta client or a winner of a client, we would love to have you on the show to talk about that. We've got some ideas of people that we might want to reach out to. But first, we want to hear from you as the community to go, hey, I'd love to be on the show. I'd love to share my story and help the community out. Jennifer, do you want to tell people how they can do that? They can go to podcasteditormastermind.com slash be a guest. Yeah. Or Reach they can to email us. us and we updated our email, but I don't, I oh, yes. don't remember so, what it is. <laughs> um, our email address is um, yeah, at podcasteditorsmastermind.com. You can email us there. However, there's more than one way to spell um because, yeah. So if you email us info at podcasteditorsmastermind.com, that will also get through to us. And uh, hopefully we'll notice it. But yeah, it, we made it a little bit easier for you. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, Steve, you're the guest. So Poddex question of the day, number from one to five. Number two. two. One, two. Oh, no. <laughs> you do that every time. Yeah. Well, it's because every time it's something that I might be embarrassing. <laughs> Which words or phrases do you most overuse? Oh, that's a, that's a crutch word question, right? It is now. <laughs> yeah. You know, I say, you know, too much. Steve took my answer, so I'm going to go with so, because that's my transition word. I don't know. I picked it up at work, and I haven't been able to get rid of it. Relatable. Relatable? Mm -hmm. Is that your word? Is that your word, or are you talking about me with so? Both. <laughs> I'm like, if something's relatable, I say relatable. Now, when it comes to like podcasts, when I, when I was on radio and I listened back to the recordings of an interview show I did, it was wow. After everything, wow, my, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. I got to quit that. So it, yeah. it used to be wow, but I'm going to say I, I use the word relatable a lot. Patrick says that his is definitely, you know, and also awesome. And I should, I, I actually missed one of his comments when we were talking about other income streams. He also mentioned that he teaches some piano lessons. So yeah, definitely something to think about. Uh, you don't have to be a podcast editor only. You can do other things too. Anything else, Jennifer, before we wrap it up? I think that's all I've got. I think that's it. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you for having me again. For those watching or listening, definitely want to make sure that if you're interested, you go check out podcasteditoracademy.com. That's the home of all of the things that we've been, or almost all the things we've been talking about in terms of finding clients, joining a community, all that kind of stuff. That's where you'll find Steve. Is there any place else that you'd like for us to share on your behalf, Steve? I do have one thing. Uh, this will be helpful. This is relatable. In the Podcast Center Academy, we have a, uh, a PDF, downloadable PDF. You can go sign up at podcastcenteracademy.com slash 10 ways. That's one zero ways. PDF will give you 10 different ways you can look for clients. So social media or meetups or conferences and, and all the different places. So that that's a great way to kind of sit down, say, what am I trying and what's going well, what's not working. And maybe you think of something new from there too. Nice. Thanks, Steve. You're he welcome. has all the things. Jennifer, do you want to take us out? I'll take us out. I'm Jennifer Longworth. You can find me at bourbonbarrelpodcasting.com. I don't do video yet. And that's why I tell everybody in my pitch now. I say, hi, I'm a podcast editor. I don't do video. And now I will continue with my pitch. But I'm starting to rethink that. And our guest has been Steve. Uh, anything else to share in terms of how to find you, Steve? 
Find me in the socials at Steve Stewart Me. Nice. Unable to join us tonight were Daniel Abendroth at rothmedia.audio and Carrie Caulfield, who you can find at carrie.land. I'm Brian Itzminger. If you want to find me, you'll find me at toptieraudio.com. And if you don't want to find me after this, I get it. But thank you for joining us. We appreciate you. Thank you Bye. all. Uh, um, so how much is that? Did I end it? No. Yes. Okay. <laughs> 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 That's that. Upload complete. All right.